Welcome to Earth Optimism. I'm your host, Johannes Lamere. And in this episode, we're going to explore species and the spaces they live in. Smithsonian scientists study the movements, migrations, and actions of the species around the world to better understand them and their relationship to the people. There are advances in new technology that are allowing scientists to more accurately track a larger variety of species. For instance, scientists are now employing solar-powered GPS devices and drones to better capture data. From giraffe and bison to butterflies and bee cats, understanding species movements provide us valuable data that helps us understand the delicate balance between animals and humans. Have you ever wondered how scientists actually study some animals? How they get their data, especially from animals that would seem difficult to find and work with, like sharks? Let's see what Smithsonian scientists are doing to learn more about sharks and their movements. The Movement of Life Initiative is a new program at the Smithsonian to understand how animals that move and migrate throughout their lives. It's broken up into three parts on mammals, birds, and fish. And I'm the lead on the, the fish side where we study sharks, rays, and other kinds of fish. We're tracking the sharks with technology called acoustic telemetry, where you have a, a tag that's implanted in the shark that sends out a series of pings or, or sounds every couple of minutes. Um, then we have, uh, research, both we and other researchers on the Atlantic coast have uh, receivers in the water that pick up those sounds and record the, the number. Um, so we're able to tag sharks and then um, working with this coast-wide network of researchers, uh, track their migrations up and down the coast. We're studying four species of sharks, the bull shark, dusky shark, black tip shark, and smooth dogfish. The dusky shark is a, a large coastal shark uh, that's one of the most threatened sharks along the U.S. East Coast, uh, but there's not much known at all about what habitats are important for it um, or what its migration patterns are. Um, so the information we generate on that could be critical to helping it survive as a, an important species along the coast. We're studying the black tip shark in part because they have very long migrations along the coast, um, connecting habitats in faraway places like Virginia and Florida. You can see one of their migrations live on our website, which is movementoflife.si.edu. Next up, we travel to the Amazonian rainforest of Ecuador to learn how the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute is striking the wire tail mannequins. And from there, we will go to Myanmar to learn how scientists are learning to track Asian elephants. Wire tail mannequins are a really interesting species of bird. Two males will do these very ritualized dances, and these are really unique behaviors in nature where we have male partners displaying with each other, so they're actually cooperating to attract females. My name is Brent Ryder, and I'm a research ecologist with the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. We've been trying to study the hormonal basis of what drives cooperative behavior in wire tail mannequins. This research is going to highlight not only the benefits of engaging in those types of cooperative behaviors, but help us understand what drives those behaviors in individuals. And this morning we're going to do some bird banding. We have a number of tools that we use for measuring the birds, their bills and their legs and their wings. It's like a short doctor's visit. We're about to put a coded tag on this bird. This is the way we're collecting data on who interacts with who. So this tag will emit a signal about every 20 seconds. And anytime this male 
comes into close proximity to the receiver that we put in his territory, it will pick him up. The other individuals who interact with him will also have tags, and so when they're present together, they'll both get pinged by the receiver. So we give the birds a little juice after their doctor's visit. It's kind of like you would get juice after you give blood at the blood bank. So this here is the, the whip antenna that's used to detect the male when he's in close proximity to the receiver. So we try to put this antenna in relatively close proximity to the male's display perch. And his display perch happens to be right down here. It's a nice location for him. We can download the data from these receivers which have been sitting out in the forest for seven to 10 days. Hopefully there's been some detections of this male. I actually think he might be around right now. Let's see if we can hear him. And there he is. That clicking noise kind of sounds like a cricket. And the tag is pinging every 20 seconds. One of the things that this technology enables us to do is actually measure which males are friends with other males and how often do they spend time together. And we can then correlate those types of behaviors with the hormone data that we're collecting when we take blood samples from individual birds. We're collecting these hormone samples to measure testosterone in male mannequins. And so we found some really interesting results. In non-territorial males, we see testosterone actually promoting cooperative behavior, which is counter to everything we think about when we think about testosterone. It's normally the aggression hormone. And in territorial males, the older males, testosterone actually has that effect. Males that have higher testosterone, they have reduced cooperative behavior. Engaging in these social partnerships actually helps males climb the social ladder. These young males will form these partnerships with older males, and the more partnerships they have, the more likely they are to climb the social ladder, if you will, and ascend to territorial status. From the territorial male perspective, those males who have lots of other male partners actually have higher reproductive success. They're beautiful birds. We're also interested in conserving this behavioral diversity. If we don't understand the basic biology of these species, there's no way for us to protect and conserve the biodiversity on our planet. My name is John McAvoy, and I'm a movement ecologist. We are in Myanmar, and we are here on our Asian elephant GPS tracking program. It's really quite incredible that the Asian elephant, if you look at where it lives and where humans live, the most densely populated parts of the world, and yet we know comparatively little about them. We are trying to call our elephants to learn very basic stuff about their movement. We want to know where and when and how they move around the landscape. All of that basic ecology can be learned from tracking the elephants. We have been collaring elephants with GPS trackers since 2014. We're hoping to put on an extra 15 collars this year. These collars will give a GPS location every hour throughout the night and day for the next two years. These collars are expensive, but the data that we get from them is priceless. The bigger spread we can get and the more areas we can collar the elephants, the more questions we can answer. The habitat is being lost. Their populations are going down very, very rapidly. They're not very easy to find on foot. Our trackers have to spend hours and hours in the, in the bush. The mahouts, they spend their whole lives around elephants, working with elephants. A lot of these mahouts are similar in age to the elephants that they work with, and they form quite a strong bond with their elephants. And it's really that knowledge that helps them find elephants. It's why they can find them so much quicker and so much better than we can. There seems to be a number of them have crossed here very recently. You can see the vegetation and the footprints and that trail just right here, you can see all the broken vegetation. They're likely to be pretty close. Dr. Zoll and his team are preparing the tranquilizer dart so that we can safely approach and collar the elephant. We'll let them go ahead a little bit and then we're going to follow after them and try to keep as close as we can.
often when they take a route they'll break some branches very obviously for us to be able to see where to go. We're just looking for those signs. I'm already thinking of what this is going to tell us and what we're going to learn from this elephant. 213 centimeters. We've been working on a mobile app collection system where our data collectors can go out with a phone in their hand. They can go to a site and as soon as they come back into an area that has either phone signal or Wi-Fi, all of that data is immediately sent to me back in the United States. This will really take our data collection just another step forward and streamline everything. So all of that information has already been sent. It's currently saved on our servers. We reckon he's about 15. Okay. Later than half hours. Will the uh, Mahouts stay nearby to see the yeah, we will see. We will see another, uh, another uh, little far away. Yeah. Another the elephant. If the elephant get it, we will leave. Okay. trying to pick up the VHF beacon from the elephant that we just colored to see that it's working and we can hear it quite well. <laughs> the GPS collars really have taken things a big step forward in our knowledge because we can put a collar on and we can follow an animal for years taking hourly GPS locations. Even while we're here in the field, we can start to see the data coming through. Is there something that emerges from all of that information? Is there a story there that will actually inform future conservation decisions? Myanmar is still 60% covered by forests. So this is a really good time to be here and to be working with elephants in this ecosystem. We're so lucky to have the Smithsonian scientist, Dr. Leslie Huey, here with us to answer some questions. Welcome, Dr. Huey. Can you please tell us how animal tracking can actually help safe species? So animal tracking data is really important to provide some of the most basic information that we need to preserve species. So understanding where animals go and why is um, one of the most important things we can know in order to help better protect the habitats that they use. Um, it's also a really great way for us to understand how human actions are impacting the movement of species. So if a community is planning to build a road or, uh, or a railway, we can actually um, put tracking devices out and monitor how that might, uh, how that might influence the movement of animals across the landscape. It's also a really great way to communicate uh, the conservation needs of these species. So you don't need to have a special degree in order to interpret the, an animal's movements plotted on a map. You can see that something like an elephant to, it ranges very far, so it may need a lot of space to be protected. It may encounter humans. So we may need to take that into consideration when we are um, coming up with conservation plans to protect them. That's great. Now we have some questions that come in from students in Indonesia who are participating in the U.S. Embassy English Access Program. Let's hear their questions. Hi, I'm Olive from Senior High School 1, Bimatam. I'm the participant of U.S. Embassy's English Access Microscholarship Program. 
I would like to know what new technology are you using to track animals? That's a really good question because there's a lot of recent advances in technology that have made it easier than ever to track wildlife. So um, one of the biggest advances is miniaturized GPS trackers. And it's basically the same technology that you have in your cell phone that you use to map around the town. Um, and we can miniaturize that and place it into a collar or an ear tag and monitor an animal anywhere in the world at any time of day. So um, there's also some some new tools where that don't involve actually attaching a device to an animal. And you can just fly something like a drone um, or even use very high resolution satellites to collect images and video of entire groups of animals in the wild. And so maybe for an animal that's harder to capture and put a tag on, or if you want to study a lot of species at once or a lot of animals at once, um, these tools can be really useful for that. And we, in order to uh, handle all of this information, we need to partner with people like computer scientists to develop new tools to help us process all this imagery. So we use tools like artificial intelligence uh, to automatically detect species in these videos and actually track their movements in really high resolution so we can see where every animal is across the landscape and track their movements. Hi, my name is Febrianti from Madrasa Alia Wahidashi Mbalu. I'm from Jember and I'm a participant of US Embassy's English Access Micro Scholarship Program. I would like to know why do you think animal tracking is important to study? Thank you. That's a really important question. <laughs> so, um, it's as I said before, it's one of the most basic pieces of information that you can collect about an animal. So it's important for thinking about conservation planning. So we want to make sure we aren't, uh, we're, there aren't that many resources available to protect wildlife. So we want to make sure we're using them wisely and animal tracking data can help us make sure that we are designing protected areas or corridors in a way that is actually going to be useful to the animals that we're trying to protect. That's great. And thank you so much for your time and expertise, Dr. Huey. Great insights. Thank you so much. And now we are going to look at one last species that Smithsonian scientists are tracking on the northern plains of Montana, the great American bison. This iconic animal was almost extinct but it now is steadily rebounding. Bison used to roam these grasslands in tens of millions, and by moving across this landscape, grazing or distributing seeds and wallowing, they created unique types of vegetation, which in turn created diverse habitats for other species. And then they were gone. The area, perfect for mega grazers, became home to cattle ranching. Without bison engineering this landscape, some grass and species seem to be losing their place. Pronghorn need mixed grasses for their diet. Chestnut colored longspur need bare ground and shorter grasses to breed in this ecosystem. And without bison grazing behavior, we're losing that diversity. With bison back on the land, it's an opportunity to understand their precise role on the landscape and how they impact it. We have two main mango grazers on this landscape. That bison has been introduced here after 100 years. And we have cattle. And how do these two species differ? That's what I'm interested in. We want to know how bison are shaping the ecosystem through their movement and behavior. And the first step is learning where they go. 
We're gonna put a color just like this one on the animal. Um, this is a GPS color that talks to the satellite and transmits data to us. The top part is the GPS and right here on the bottom we have the battery. And right here we have a mechanism which is called a drop off. So in a year, this is going to open and the collar will drop off and we'll come and collect it from the field. We have two people that are trained to handle bison. They are from American Prairie Reserve. They've gone through vigorous training. These two people are the only ones who touch the drugs, dart the animal. What do you think about the one at 12 o'clock? Do it. The one on the left is clearly too big, but the right two, they're the same age class. We're going to stop here and get Lars all set, and then we are going to go after one in the group by the road. Starts in. We're trying to finish up putting on the collar and taking all the other additional measurements in about 15 minutes. The most important thing is, is the animal welfare and also people's welfare while handling such large animals. Once we're done, we give the reversal and we will watch as the animal gets up and we continue to watch it just to make sure that it's doing okay, that it went back to its group. It was great. It was fast. This is a movement of one bison that we collared late April. So just in three months, we found out that bison move all over these pastures. They are changing the grassland in a completely different way than what we would see in cattle pastures. You have to rotate cattle all the time to make sure that they're not overgrazing different parts. But with bison, they keep moving. They just rotate themselves. They are utilizing basically every part of the grasslands. We're getting a very fine scale view into what bison do on a daily basis. I'm really excited to see what we'll see next in the next nine months. That wraps up this episode. It is fascinating to see all the ways that technology is helping scientists tag and track animal species around the world to see how that data can actually help us preserve the species. If you want to learn more, I encourage you to visit our website at earthoptimism.si.edu for more information and resources. See you in the next episode. Thank you and bye.